I will fight to the last. The military has struggled to make alliances here and plans to pull back into more populated areas as an increasing number of rural villages are siding with the Taliban. We must focus our resources and prioritize in those areas where the population is most threatened. These are pretty we don't have our to do everything everywhere at once. The Taliban put out a statement after the attacks claiming responsibility and saying if the U.S. increases its forces, so will we. This is a tricky situation because abandoning remote areas will leave the people there vulnerable to insurgents. But staying there might mean more attacks like these, Robin. Well, Chris, you've been on the ground now a couple of days. It's been a couple of years since you were last in Afghanistan. What difference, in, if any, are you seeing and what are the soldiers telling you, Chris? Well, the fighting men and women here are very confident, Robin. They believe they can take on the Taliban and beat them in the long run. What they're worried about is what they say is the more important campaign, the one to build the Afghan people's will to fight against the Taliban themselves. And attacks like these do not build confidence with the locals. All right, Chris, thanks so much. Chris Cornell in Afghanistan. We'll get back to you later. Stay safe. And on that question of confidence among the Afghan people, we had a chance to talk to Ambassador Peter Galbraith, who was publicly fired last week as deputy head of the United Nations mission in Afghanistan because he indicted the recent presidential election there as a fraud, as many as 30% of the votes faked. It's just another factor in the choice facing President Obama and the nation, trying to decide should America add more troops to try to secure Afghanistan or reduce its presence and try to target Al-Qaeda another way. Here now, our conversation with Ambassador Galbraith. Peter Galbraith, we thank you for joining us this morning. Let me get right to this deadliest month, potentially, in the history of the eight-year Afghan war. If you were advising the president this morning, would you tell him to ramp up now or that it's a losing battle? Neither. Uh, but in the absence of having a credible Afghan partner, that is to say, a government that is, uh, enjoys the support of the people and is accepted by those that did not vote for uh, the man who emerges as president, it makes no sense to ramp up. On the other hand, we cannot afford to pull out. Let me play devil's advocate for a moment. The president would say he doesn't have the luxury of a perfect world. He has to make a decision in this world and this climate. So again, the choice between more troops, which General McChrystal would argue would at least secure more of the high density populations, or no surge at this point at all, what, what would you say to him? At this point, no surge. Uh, we don't. Of course, we don't operate in, in a perfect world, but we also don't have un unlimited resources. And unless those troops can secure an area in a way that then Afghan partners, the government, the Afghan army, the Afghan police can come in and fill in after them, we're going to be there as an occupying force for a very long time. And that, to me, doesn't make sense. The only way this works is if we, if we can make a transition to an effect to the Afghans, and that requires an effective, credible government, which in turn requires an election in which the Afghan people have confidence. One of the critical and determining factors in Iraq was that the chieftains, the tribal chieftains, decided that it was in their better interest to uh, oppose the insurgents than to work with them. Are there signs in Afghanistan that the tribal leaders there are ready and ripe for the possibility of? holding out on their own. Unfortunately, there's no analogy between what happened in Iraq and, and what's going on in, in Afghanistan. In Iraq, in the Sunni areas of the country, uh, the, the Al-Qaeda element, the fundamentalists, uh, moved from attacking the Shiites to attacking the tribal sheikhs themselves. So this was a matter of their self-defense. Uh, in Afghanistan, uh, the tribal elders, uh, are, are, uh, many of them are supporting the Taliban, they are the Taliban, or, and this is the more common situation, they are neutral. They see no reason to uh, choose the, a government uh, which they experience as inefficient, corrupt, and abusing power. You were fired for speaking up. Any second thoughts? Yes. Uh, ab absolutely not. Uh, the fraud that that uh, took place in the uh, in Afghanistan was preventable, uh, and it could have been dealt with more effectively after the fact. 
I, the unfortunate of the United Nations, which had responsibility to support free, fair, and transparent elections in Afghanistan, not fraudulent ones, did not uh, exercise its responsibility when the ind so-called Independent Election Commission tried to change its rules to include fraudulent ballots in the count. I tried to stop that. He, he blocked me. He sided with Karzai, who, of course, was the beneficiary of the fraud. So no second thoughts. I have no second thoughts, not at all. Peter Galbraith, again, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Diane, great to be with you. And we will learn this week of election officials decide there was fraud in the election and require a